If you were told that you had only three days to live, do you think you would live any differently? Now, the Thessalonians had listened to false teachers. These false teachers were preaching things like blood moons, and they were sharing around videos of Jesus riding a horse through the clouds. Now, I'm being facetious because that's what we do today. But the false teachers in Thessalonica had been telling the congregation Jesus had already come for the church, and now all that was left was his second coming in wrath and judgment. Bad teaching led to bad living. So what would you do differently with only three days to live? Maybe pray all day, camp out at the church building, would you make up with family and friends that you've been separated from for years or decades? Maybe you'd tell others about Jesus or spend every penny you have to live large. Perhaps you would rob a bank. Or maybe you would abandon everything, climb the nearest mountain, and just wait to see Jesus before everybody else. Years ago, our congregation faced a major crisis one Sunday morning. Before starting the morning service, my wife was nervous and asked how we should respond. My answer was simply, business as usual. We needed to do that day exactly as we'd done the Sunday before and the Sunday before and the Sunday before. We were there that morning to do a job, and that's exactly what we had to do. But there were some in the Thessalonian church who had abandoned what Paul told them. Facing what they believed was the last day of the last days, they had failed or maybe even refused business as usual. The bad teaching of the false teachers produced bad living. So follow with me as we read 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses number 6 and 7, as we talk this morning on the subject of three commands. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, but we were not disorderly among you. So verse number six begins with the word command, and that's an order from a superior officer. Paul and Silas and Timothy are passing on a direct order, and yet the direct order was not coming from them. The command wasn't from the sweet, meek, and mild baby Jesus laying in a manger, nor was it from the Jesus who never said a harsh word, never turned anyone away, and never made anyone feel uncomfortable. In fact, the command came from the commander-in-chief of the church. Paul calls him our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul noticed uses the full biblical title for the head of the church. And what he's commanding here are not nice suggestions for nice Christians. These are stiff, unbending, cut and dried commandments. But I'd also have you notice, Paul tempers the commandments by addressing the Thessalonians by that important, lovely word, brethren. He's making this appeal to his family in God the Father. He addresses them as equals in the faith with a tender bond of love. The command is to those whom God and the missionary trio loved and had great concern for. The commandment is in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you and I hear those words, our minds might move to the idea of prayer. Jesus did tell his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 13, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The idea of praying in the name of Jesus 
is for many people a little phrase that they tack on at the end of their prayer to make it official. It's kind of like the word amen. Amen is used to let other people know that you're finally done talking. In my childhood, I listened to a family member pray for me, and I've never forgotten it. Over and again, he kept repeating the name Jesus, like it was a magical formula that made his prayer powerful. So what does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus? It's like the saying to the fleeing criminal, stop in the name of the law. Or maybe you remember the 1963 hit by Diana Ross and the Supremes, which I will not sing, by the way. Stop in the name of love. So ask yourself, what is the law's name? Does love have a name? Or are these figures of speech? In the ancient world, a name was more than merely a way to identify a person. A person's name stood for the total character and the attributes of the person. So praying in the name of Jesus, we are saying more than just those specific words, quote, in the name of Jesus. What we're doing is stating our conviction that what we are asking the Father is, is exactly what Jesus himself would be asking. We're saying that our request is humbly melded to his will and his purpose and his character and his authority. Praying in the name of Jesus is as if Jesus himself is speaking. So we had better be careful that what we are praying is in submission to the character and the will of Jesus himself. Now this first command of Jesus, given by Paul, seems to be extremely harsh, especially in the society in which we live today, especially in the church environment that we find ourselves today. Notice the command first withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. This word withdraw is a word from the world of sailing. It was used for when the crew of a ship furled the sails. So some of you don't even know what the word furl means, F-U-R-L. The Greek word is stelo, and it means to roll up, to fold up, or to put away a piece of cloth, especially the sail of a boat or ship. Paul is telling the church as a whole in Thessalonica to keep away, withdraw, and to avoid other brethren in the congregation. And do pay special attention He's not saying to do this to outsiders, but they are to withdraw from brethren. Look further on in verse number 14. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person. The word literally means to place a mark on, to put an X across. Note that person and do not keep company with him that he might be ashamed. The don't judge me crowd rejects this commandment of Jesus. The don't judge me crowd has never obviously read the Bible, so I even refuse to engage them. They're biblically ignorant, they're willfully rebellious, and they are self-righteously legalistic. They are, as I called them last time, the sloppy agape crowd. They will put love at the forefront of even truth or obedience. Last week, I told you the story of Polycarp and the heretic Marcion. When the Saint Polycarp met the ain't Marcion on the street, 
he employed the command of the Apostle John in 2 John, there's only one chapter, verses number 10 and 11. Turn and look at this with me. John wrote this letter to a Christian woman and her children, and John commended them for their commitment to biblical truth. And truth is a word that John uses five times in 13 verses here. This woman and her family were also commended for showing Christian love by feeding and sheltering traveling preachers. We need to remember, in the ancient world, there were no hotels as you and I know them today. At best, you might find what was called an inn, which was really nothing more than a place where you could lay on the floor. So there was a problem, though, with this woman and her children. The woman and her children had sacrificed the truth by accepting false teachers into their home in the name of love. Follow along as I read. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. John had been writing earlier in this little epistle about the doctrine of Christ and who he is. So John's theme here in his second epistle gives to us that truth is the boundary of Christian love. And can you see with me how clear the boundary is? If you support or befriend or show hospitality to a false teacher, you have actually sinned by partnering with him in his evil. Now, this does not mean that we should treat false teachers and fake believers in a mean fashion, but we are not to even recognize them at all personally. If you do, understand that God considers you as that evil man's partner, and then other believers will see you as endorsing him and his lies and his wicked behavior. There are boundaries to the expression of our love as Christians. One of those boundaries is biblical orthodoxy, biblical truth. It's a false love which loves without any judgment or discernment. In the same way that you would never snuggle up with a poisonous snake, in the same way that you would a baby rabbit, you and I must avoid those who reject the fundamental truths of Scripture. There are no ifs, ands, or buts to this command from our Commander-in-Chief, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now looking back at 2 Thessalonians, notice in verse number 6, I want to point out another important word. Paul writes, withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. Don't just withdraw from the ones that you don't like very much. You need to withdraw from every single one of them. And we'll have much more to say on this subject when we reach verses 14 and 15 in a few weeks. Now, the issue here was twofold. The first is the one who claims to be a Christian, and may actually be, and yet he walks disorderly. We're very familiar with this word walk. It's a figure of speech that describes a person's habit of living or their lifestyle. Those who have a habit of disorder must be withdrawn from. Disorderly is another of the many military words used by Paul in his letters. The word disorderly pictures a soldier who is out of step while marching with his fellow soldiers. 
You've seen it in a movie or video or maybe even live. There's a soldier or the member of a marching band who loses cadence with those around him. And while the others are marching left, right, left, right, left, right, there's one guy who is stepping left, left, right, shuffle, left, right. He's completely out of step. That is the word that Paul uses here, disorderly. You know, Christianity is not a do-as-you-please religion. It's also not an individualistic faith. Our worship isn't independent of other people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 and 34, Paul corrected some errors of worship and the use of spiritual gifts. And in these two verses, there must have been some who said of Paul and his correction, but Paul, we're better than other congregations. We know what we're doing. We can do what we want. We can do what we feel. We can do as, quote, the Spirit leads us. What you want for us to follow is just a cultural suggestion. No, no, no. And Paul sums up his correction regarding the abuse of spiritual gifts by writing these words. Follow along. For God is not the author of confusion. And the word confusion there is literally disorder. God is not the author of disorder, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silent in the churches. A few verses later in verse number 40, the Holy Spirit inspires Paul to add, let all things be done decently and in order. Not only are we to live our lives as Christian individuals with order, but our corporate worship must also have order. Years ago, a leader of the denomination I grew up in said, quote, If you go to church and know what's going to happen next, that church is dead. End quote. But friends, that is not what the Apostle Paul wrote. A congregation that flies by the seat of its pants and does whatever the Spirit leads at the moment or so they think, that is the congregation in sin. So we need to ask ourselves, how were these brethren in Thessalonica living disorderly lives? From the later verses, we know the answer to the question. Because they believed Jesus was coming back to judge the world and to set up his earthly kingdom at any moment, these believers had stopped working, and they were demanding that others take care of them. Others would provide for their needs. They felt entitled. You are probably like me. You've had people whom you don't really know ask you for money. People from other countries might target you because you're an American, and they wrongly believe that all Americans are millionaires with loads of cash to spare. Sometimes they will try to make you feel guilty because of your skin color or your nationality or even your faith. I had a man in India, a man I don't even know, wrote me on Facebook recently with a sad story, including pictures of disabled children on the street. He asked me to send him money to buy dozens and dozens of these children Christmas gifts. I wrote back and I thanked him for the work he was doing with these children. Whether it was true or not, I don't know. And then I told him I didn't have thousands of dollars to send to him. 
I've also had many people in an African nation that have refused to speak to me, write to me, or even fellowship with me in any way after I didn't send them money for their weddings. Because I live in America, they expect that I will send them money for a wedding that far exceeds and outspends their ability to live. The show of splendor to many is an absolutely necessary part of something to show to their friends and family. Now these people will either double down on the guilt or they will bless you and ask that you remember to simply pray for them. And that Indian man by Facebook was of this latter type. He thanked me anyway, and then he asked me for prayer. You know, that is how a Christian works. That man wasn't some con artist preying on an ignorant, gullible, or guilty man. So beloved, be careful how you use the resources that God gives to you. If you give money to every sad story, pathetic photograph, or hand held out to grab, you're often enabling theft of what God has given to you, or you're encouraging those people to steal from others. If you are using manipulation to get money from someone else, you are stealing from them. So if you have enough money to send every Tom, Dick, and Harry, beware. God is testing you. He may be testing your generosity, but he may also be testing your gullibility. These lazy ones in the Thessalonian assembly could have been the false teachers, or they could have been the ones who believed the preaching of the false teachers. The false teachers may have even been using their false doctrines about the end time specifically for personal gain. They may have been saying things like this, send me your $10 gift today because you know you only have three days left. Support my ministry because Jesus is coming back. These lazy Thessalonians expected the brethren in the church to meet their needs in life. We're not talking about the sick. We're not talking about the disabled. We're not talking about the elderly. Paul is going to make clear in the next verses of what he's talking about, who he's speaking of specifically. He's writing about believers who could and should have taken care of their own needs. And the problem might have been that they were living beyond their means. They were spending more money than they had in order to put up a front to other people. Perhaps they'd just given up. You know, the Bible says that lazy hands have a way of creating busy lips. Listen to what God says to unmarried women under the age of 60 years old. This comes from 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. They learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Do you know what the solution for idle gossip and busybodying is? Paul doesn't say that these ladies need to go to Bible studies. He doesn't write that they need to join a convent. The solution is in the verse, verse number 14. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry bear children, manage the house, and give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. I don't know what you think, but I think that is really clear. You see, what you believe, your doctrine, 
has a direct bearing on how you live. Godly theology leads to godly living. God's order in life has always included labor. Remember back to the beginning when God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He gave them the responsibility to tend and keep the garden. Genesis 2 verse number 15. That responsibility didn't become toilsome until after they sinned. After they sinned, God uses words like sorrow, pain, control, rule, cursed, thorns, thistles, toil, sweat, and death. Genesis 3 verses 17 through 19. Now, those words don't sound at all pleasant, and they are not. So we were created by God as a race, the human race, from the very beginning in part to work. We don't work because of sin, but God instituted work for humanity before the fall. It was part of God's plan for humanity in his good and very good creation from day one of man's existence. Granted, work today is complicated and toilsome, but it is because of sin, and every believer must work if he can. Now, pastor, you're meddling. Yes, I sure am. You know, those whose feelings or political views are hurt by this kind of meddling are the very same ones who insist on practical preaching instead of teaching doctrine. I know it. I've met you before. You want the practical over the theological, but only as long as it puffs your ego and your own self-righteousness. You want three steps to spiritual living. You want easy-peasy works of righteousness so you can pat yourself on the back. But you, my friend, are living under the law and you have turned away from grace, if you ever knew what grace really was to begin with. You want the practical only as long as it doesn't affect what you personally believe and feel. And here's why it's so important for you and me to know the theological teaching of the Bible before we get to the practical living. Once you know the why of God's will, you'll be humble and prepared to do the what of his will. Most people, I think, can see areas in their lives where they fall short. There's the husband who falls short in his marriage, the mother who knows she doesn't always love and sometimes even like her children. There's that unmarried one whose relationships always fall into sexual immorality. And there's the poor man whose greed causes him to be jealous of his neighbor who has more than he does. A lot of these people, I believe, want to change their lives. And I'm all in favor of changing your life. I wish you could change your life. Whereas three steps might reform your behavior. Three steps, seven steps, 12 steps will never change your heart or your eternal destination. You can clean up the outside of your life but you can't change your heart, my friend. A new heart is only possible if a heart surgeon intervenes. And the heart surgeon I'm referring you to this morning didn't graduate from Stanford University. He didn't intern at Johns Hopkins. He didn't practice at the Mayo Clinic. The heart surgeon I'll direct your attention to 
is the one who created you, the one whom we call the great physician. He not only gave sight to the blind, caused the lame to walk, healed people who for decades doctors couldn't even diagnose. He's the one who healed lepers and epileptics. He's the one who raised the dead. And I don't just mean he raised someone from the dead who was pronounced dead on an operating table for 30 minutes. I'm talking about a guy named Lazarus who was dead, who was buried, and whose body was already decomposing for four days. Jesus will go beyond healing your broken heart. Jesus will give you a new heart. He won't patch up the old one with a bit of spackle and some fresh paint, but he will replace your heart of stone with one of living flesh. The Lord Jesus went to the cross to bear your sins. He surrendered his life to wicked men so your life could be brought before the Father in heaven. Today, I beg you to forget the faith healers and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I implore you this morning, and you will be saved. His promise is as true and faithful as he is. So there were some in the Thessalonian church who, because of their end-time theology, which was not biblical, they neglected their responsibility. And their responsibility was to work rather than demand that others take care of them. They might have been laying guilt on some in order to get support. Maybe they were begging. Some of them might have believed that they were better than needing to work for their own living. And it really doesn't matter. No matter the cause of the problem, the solution was exactly the same, and it's exactly the same today. Either get to work or be removed from fellowship with the saints of God. Yikes! Now that doesn't seem very loving, does it? And yet that is the command of Jesus himself. So the first reason for the whole congregation to withdraw from some of the brethren was their disorder. The second reason was failing or refusing to walk. Notice what Paul writes according to the tradition received from us. That word tradition is one that we've looked at before. It's one that we examined back in chapter number two, verse number 15. And there Paul writes, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. In that message on that passage, we learned that this word tradition, paradosis in Greek, has absolutely nothing to do with the things that we personally hold dear, or our habits, or the things that we've just always done, or our culture, even church culture. Paradosis refers to the scriptural truth that Paul taught when he was with the church and the scriptural truth that he wrote to a church. In other words, the tradition is the scripture. It's the timeless truths of heaven given to us by the Holy Spirit through the prophets 
and the apostles, and then recorded for us in the pages of the New Testament. Anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus but does not believe the Scripture, or who doesn't follow the fundamental truths of the Scripture, you and I are commanded by Jesus to withdraw from. Oh, but pastor, so-and-so has gone to church for 30 years. But pastor, she is so nice and she says she's a Christian. My friends, you cannot call yourself a Christian and reject the simplest things of the word of God. Now in verse number seven, Paul gives his third command. The third command in only two verses. Withdraw from those who don't walk in step. Withdraw from those who don't walk in obedience to the word of God. And now the command is to follow the example that Paul and Silas and Timothy lived among them. Because, he writes, we were not disorderly among you. Paul and Silas and Timothy, the whole three-man missionary team, did not expect other people in Thessalonica to meet their needs. Now let me say, Paul here isn't addressing the responsibility of the local church to meet the financial needs of their pastor. We're going to get to that again at a later date, as Paul does in these closing words of 2 Thessalonians. But he is warning them, follow our example, we were not disorderly among you. Paul is saying that he and his companions lived orderly lives and they did not expect others to take care of them. In fact, Paul is saying, that he and Silas and Timothy lived exactly what they taught. They lived in such a way that their preaching and their lifestyle were complementary. 